Good morning all. Uh, This morning we're going to pick up one of the key themes that we've already heard of in Hebrews. It's not really the next sermon in the series that Noel's been leading us in, but I won't won't be saying anything new, but hopefully plenty which is true. Um, Noel simply asked me to pick up a theme that's risen out of the series that we have been going through, and I've chosen to look at the matter of conscience. I spoke a couple of years ago um, on the conscience. I won't be repeating all that. If you want to look it up, you can check it out on Sermon Audio. And also, I just remind you that a while back, Noel mentioned Peter Farmer um, had some uh, MP3s of uh, a series that Jeff did on conscience many years ago, um, Conscience Conquered or Conquering, conquered, Conquering or Conquered. Um, it would be worth getting a hold of that if you haven't already. The title for this morning, just to uh, put you in the framework, and in the framework of Hebrews is a clean conscience every day, or perhaps a little more cliche, an encouragement a day keeps guilt at bay. <laughs> Maybe too trite and cliche, but it's actually true, which hopefully we'll see before the end of this morning. But first of all, what is our conscience? We've all got one, something that gives us an indication or a sense of what we should be doing or not be doing, what's right and what's wrong. Our consciences are a part of us, they're part of our created being, aren't they? But they're actually culturally conditioned. It's formed by the law of God, but also by the laws and expectations of man and of the society we grow up in. A number of years ago when I was in China, we had to be very careful. I'm a bit of a fast walker, just I don't sort of like dilly-dallying. And in China, they're quite sedate, they don't rush around a lot. You walk through the streets, quite often you would walk past the Chinese folk but the men over there have a habit of spitting, just on the sidewalk. So you had to be very careful. We were actually warned before we left, when you walk, be careful, watch how close you get as you walk past people, because they just, for them it's normal. For us here it would be quite disgusting maybe, if we were just walking down the streets and that was happening. For them there's no issue for their conscience for that to happen. For us there is. Which one's true? Well, in China, it's right over there. They're actually trying to stop it. In China, there's big yellow signs saying, please do not spit. They're trying to change the culture and change people's conscience. But it's culturally conditioned. In one of the Living Faith studies that Jeff Ritt wrote a number of decades ago, he tells us, our conscience is the awareness that we have in regard to what is right and wrong. But fallen humanity have this awareness together now with a sense of guilt and the fear of condemnation. Before the fall, the awareness we had of right and wrong would not have involved condemnation and guilt. It was all to do with our knowledge and relationship with God. But since the fall, we now have that awareness of what's right and wrong, and together with it, an awareness of condemnation and guilt. Following on from that, the state of our conscience, therefore, whether it's guilty or innocent, whether it's cleansed or not, will determine our view of God and also determines our response to him. Just stop and think about that for a moment. The state of our conscience, whether guilty or innocent, cleansed or not, will determine our view of God and determine our response to him. A guilty conscience will only see God as a tyrant, as a judge without grace or mercy. In one sense it sees God truly, part of God's character, holy and righteous. He's unable to just gloss over sin, but it fails to see the goodness and faithfulness of God and his grace. It sees a true part of God, but not the fullness of his character. A cleansed conscience, on the other hand, will see God as he is, holy and righteous as a judge, yes, but one who is compassionate and gracious slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. So there's the difference between how we see God and how we respond to him. Our conscience, as I said, is part of our makeup, part of what God has created in us. But let me ask you a question. Is your conscience reliable? Can we trust our conscience? Should we listen to our conscience? Is it the voice of God or his spirit within us or is it something else? 
the fact that we read of and are speaking of having a clean or cleansed conscience tells us that it's something that has been defiled and that without the work of God and the grace of God, that's what it remains, a defiled, unclean, guilty conscience. We cannot clean it up and it needs restoring and purifying. The conscience that was once good and true and reliable is now defiled. Fallen humanity, sinful humanity, we now have conscience actually as an enemy. Even though it might seek to have our best intentions at heart at times, it will discern for us, it will warn us and predict punishment if we do what's wrong or not do what's right. But we can't trust it. Yes, God does use our conscience. He speaks to us by it. It's by our conscience the Spirit brings conviction of sin, righteousness and judgment. But at the same time, the accuser can manipulate us via our conscience. Albeit accusing us truly, or perhaps accurately, might be a better way of saying it. But he causes us to doubt and deny the atoning work of Christ. To question God's love and his forgiveness. And therefore it leads us to futile attempts to justify ourselves, to cover up our sin, to shake off responsibility if we can and avoid facing up to those we've wronged. So no, as fallen humanity we cannot actually trust our conscience. We cannot sense that pricking of our conscience and say, ah, that's God speaking to me, I must do what it tells me. Because we can't actually do it just like that on its own. It must be weighed up and discerned in light of God's work, sorry, his word and his will. We cannot trust our conscience, but neither can we avoid the fact that it's actually in action at the very core of everything we do. You help a lady, an old lady, walk across the street, if it still happens these days. Your conscience is at work in doing that, in why you do that. Are you doing it out of a sense of duty or a sense of love? in a sense of worship and service or in fear of what might happen if you don't. Give your wife flowers. Your conscience is at work. Is it a guilt offering, trying to make up and get some brownie points for being late last night from work? Or is it a love offering? Whether we drive at the speed limit or not and why we drive at the speed limit or not, your conscience is at work. Fear of judgment, or submitting to the governing authorities, as God has asked us to. One thing we can rely upon in regards to our conscience is that it will spring into action and cause a whole lot of other things to rise up within us the moment we break a law, whether it's God's law or man's. The moment we sin against God or do that which we know we shouldn't or not do which we know we should, our consciences spring into action but what sort of action and the direction of that action will again depend upon the state of our conscience. A guilty conscience will cause fear to rise up within us, self-justification to leap into action without so much as a second thought, together with the emergence of denial and or a shift of responsibility and an attempt to cover up our guilt. And all that happens in an instant. We don't even have to try to work it out and weed our way out of it. It just happens without us thinking much about it at all. All of that is not just a response to the situation at hand, it's actually a response to God and his holiness. It's a fight or flight response. We run and hide and hope we get away with it because we know that we deserve judgment and we know that that judgment will ultimately come from God. We only have to look at Adam and Eve to see all of those things in action. It's easier to look there than it is in our own lives, isn't it? But in reality, we do exactly the same as they did. When the serpent came, as we heard, and deceived Eve, the first thing he did was attack the conscience. You won't die. God's lying to you. You'll actually be like God and know good and evil. You'll know right from wrong, apart from God. Satan's been attacking the conscience from the very beginning and he hasn't stopped. And the response to that, to those actions, 
Adam and Eve eaten from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The first thing they do is cover themselves up. Guilt and shame rise up within them. They run or they hide from God out of fear. And when God asks them, what's happened? What have you done? They start pointing the finger. The woman that you gave me. The serpent deceived me and I ate it. No one has taken responsibility. No one's put their hand up and said, I'm sorry. And worse still, no one's gone to God, even though God's come to them and sought forgiveness. The actions of a guilty conscience. On the other hand, a cleansed conscience, I believe, also will cause us to run, but in the opposite direction. When we've gone awry, when we've been disobedient, a cleansed conscience can actually take us to the Father, to the throne of grace where there we'll find mercy and grace in our time of need. Knowing the compassion of God, knowing the forgiveness that we've already received in Christ, we can turn to God in repentance and not away from him in fear. We know that we deserve his judgement. That hasn't changed. But a clean conscience and a regenerated conscience knows that that judgement has already taken place. And so we come before the Father seeking forgiveness, knowing it's already there, and we long to do his will. The promise of God that we read of in Ezekiel comes after Jeremiah, doesn't it? Ezekiel 36, where God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. You will be clean. I will cleanse you from all impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Once made clean, we actually desire to do God's will and we come to God and share with him in his work rather than running and hiding from his judgment. We see the work of the guilty conscience first in the garden with Adam and Eve and then in the very next generation between Cain and Abel. The work of a guilty conscience as Cain kills his brother out of jealousy and anger. His guilty conscience provoked into drastic action. There's plenty elsewhere in scripture where we see a guilty conscience at work but there's plenty also where we see the accounts of those with a clear conscience. Read the Psalms, those who come to God in repentance, those who know that with God there's forgiveness. Look to David. It took a little while for David, didn't it? After committing adultery, with Bathsheba, it took Nathan to confront him with his sin. But where did he run to? Straight to God, his judge, but his salvation, knowing there he would find mercy and forgiveness. And there's a wonderful contrast in Revelation of two groups of people. Those who have a cleansed conscience and those who don't. In chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, we read of six of the seven seals that are being opened and as each one's being opened, we hear of the judgments that are being released. Conquerors coming, removing peace, famine of plague and death and earthquakes. And in verse 15, we then read, The kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty and every slave and every free man, they hid in the caves and among the rocks on the mountains. They called on the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand? I reckon Adam and Eve probably had similar thoughts as they hid from God in the garden, hiding amongst the rocks. But here's a group in absolute fear and terror and total despair. They would rather be crushed and die than face the one who sits on the throne and and the Lamb. They're scared. 
But then in the very next chapter in Revelation 7, we see a completely different response to the same God, to the same Lamb. 7 verse 9. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They look to the throne and the Lamb and see the source of their salvation. The others look to the throne or they can't even bear to look there because all they see is their judgment. Both are true. Both groups see something of the true character of God but one group has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And when he's revealed to them, they can do nothing but worship him, bow down before him and sing, whilst the other group, they haven't been washed. And they can do nothing but run and hide and hope to escape the impending wrath and judgment. When we look to God, do we see judgment or do we see our salvation? The truth of the matter is we actually need to see both. We need to see that it's in God's judgment. It's there where our source of salvation is, where that judgment's carried out upon a cross, upon Christ. So how is it that we come to receive a clean conscience? How is our conscience cleansed? How do our robes come to be washed white like those in the book of Revelation? I don't want to repeat in detail what's been said over the past weeks but in Hebrews 9 we're told clearly that the shedding of blood sorry, that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. We're told that Christ's blood has been shed once for all that he died as a ransom to set us free from our sins. Free from them. No longer tied up with them. We're told there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And as the psalmist wrote, with you, Lord, there is forgiveness. There is unfailing love and full redemption for all our sins. Even those little ones on the side we think no one knows about. Even those thoughts in our minds that we think no one knows about. But God does and thank God that he does because if he didn't, it might be a silly way of talking, but if he didn't know about them then perhaps they wouldn't be covered on the cross. But he does and they have been. Full redemption from all our sins. We've heard in the past weeks of the Old Testament worship and the rituals. Noel took us back to Leviticus 16 where the high priest carried out his duties once a year in quite a different manner on the Day of Atonement. It was good and it was true. The worship, the ritual was given by God for the people, for the time and it was effective. <coughs> effective only by the shedding of blood and only until next time, until the next sin. And it had to be repeated year after year. Can you imagine just for a moment what it might have been like for the Israelites, for the Jews, when the temple was destroyed? For the Israelites as they were sent in exile by the Babylonians? No temple, no place to worship. Where's God now? Is the presence of God amongst us? Were the gods of the Babylonians stronger than Yahweh? And more importantly for them, how and where do we now find forgiveness? Can you imagine the despair of not knowing if God was with you and of not knowing your sins were forgiven? I think some of us actually can. I think some of us have probably been there. 
Paul writes in Ephesians, you were once separate from Christ, without hope and without God in the world. But friends, we don't need to be there, do we? The very next word of Paul's in that passage is but. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near, how? Through the blood of Christ. Christ has come as high priest and has gone through the greater and more perfect tabernacle by his own blood. How much more then, we read, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, how much more will his blood cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we might serve the living God, so that we might worship the living God? For the Israelites and the Jews to enter the temple, to come into the presence of God and to worship him, they needed to be clean and there were things they had to do for that to happen, for them to be clean, to come into the presence of God. Now, there's a difference between being clean and having a clean conscience. One's more external and to do with physical elements and rituals. The other is a more moral issue of our conscience. But both in their respective time are necessary for believers to come into the presence of God and worship him. And both are granted to us by the grace of God through faith in Christ. How much more then will the blood of Christ cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death? Or I think the translation we heard this morning from dead works. They're not just evil things that we do, although they, they are, but not probably in the, think of, in the way of what we think about them. They're self-justifying works, the things we do when we know we've stuffed up and try to gain God's approval by doing good deeds. It's those good deeds that are actually dead deeds because they don't lead us to life. They lead us away from God, trusting in ourselves to get his approval for our own righteousness. They don't lead us to life, to the source of salvation, where there's love and there's grace. How often do we find ourselves in those dead works? How often does it not feel like we have a clean conscience? How often does it feel like sin's crouching at the door ready to take the first opportunity and the accuser is there ready to pounce at the first sign of weakness and guilt? And chatting with folk through the week, sometimes there just seems to be no way out of it. We know all the verses, We've heard all the good sermons but still our flesh and the evil one seem to make mincemeat of it all. Our minds are just confused and we doubt our salvation and we might even doubt the promises of God and question where we stand before him. How often do we need to be encouraged in the simple truth of the gospel? That by the blood of Christ you've been saved. By the blood of Christ you have a clean conscience once and for all. How often do we need to hear that there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? That God remembers your sins no more. That though they were once scarlet red, they're now whiter than snow. As far as from the east is from the west, so are your sins. They've been taken out of the camp, dealt with and atoned for and gotten rid of altogether. They're not just nice verses. They are that, aren't they? But they're not just that. They're not just good sermons that we hear each week. They are the true and effective actions of a living God. A God who poured his wrath out upon his own son. Christ bore the sins of the world and took upon himself the judgment that was due to us. And we have been crucified with Christ. We've been raised with him and the righteous requirements of the law have been fully met. Fully met in us. So we no longer need to fear God's judgment, do we? It is finished. How often do we need to be encouraged in that? 
The writer of Hebrews tells us how often. Every day. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Why would we turn away? Neglect, maybe, yes, fear. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today. Encourage one another daily, so that none of you might be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We come to church each week, we hear a good word, a true and life-giving word, but we don't come each week to get a top-up of forgiveness, do we? to receive a little bit more grace to make up for the sins we committed last week? We mustn't. We actually come each week to remind and encourage each other of what we received in Christ once for all. And to rejoice in that and to give thanks for it. And we come to encourage one another in those things. Paul says, teaching and admonishing each other, singing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, to each other. Our worship is not all this way. It actually goes out to one another. As we sing our songs, sometimes I think we're in this cone of silence between us and God. We're encouraged to encourage one another in our worship. Sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs to each other. What are those songs all about? About God's goodness, about the salvation that comes from God, about Christ who's died for us. And if you're anything like me, well, God, have pity on you if you are. (laughs) Thanks, Ian. (laughs) But if you're anything like me, once a week each Sunday probably isn't enough. We need it every day, don't we? And I thank God for you, for my friends and for my family who remind and encourage me each day of the grace of God. But most of all, I'm thankful to God who, by his grace, when I find myself caught up in those dead works, in self-justification, he actually comes to me and he reminds me, searches my heart and tells me again simply and clearly, you are clean. You are forgiven. It's finished. Christ said it to his disciples on more than one occasion, you are clean. At one point he said, but not all of you, regarding Judas. But because of the word he had spoken to them, he said, you are clean. And because of the same word, and because of the blood that he shed at Calvary, we here this morning can hear Christ's words to us. You are clean. After eating the tree in the garden, Adam and Eve did everything that a person does who has a guilty conscience. Fear rose up, they hide from God, can't face him, shifted the blame and all of that. And they made a futile, poor attempt to cover themselves in their guilt and their shame. And God did what only a loving and holy God could do. He came to them. When they were hiding, he came looking. He was the one who uttered the first words. Words not of condemnation, but of searching for the lost. Where are you? I'm looking for you. And yes, there was punishment. There was judgment for all involved. We read of that. But even in amidst the punishment, there was a promise, a word of hope and mercy, as there always is. Look through scripture. Whenever God deals out his judgment, there is always a word of hope and mercy. Back in the garden, that word of hope and mercy is there, that there would be one to come and put an end to sin and evil once and for all. And then God did what I believe to be the most amazing thing. And I was thinking about this last week and sharing about it with some year tens at school. And for just a moment in a class of year 10 students who didn't want to be where they were, there was a bit of silence because they heard something. God did the most amazing thing. He made them garments of skin. He clothed them. 
in their futile attempt to cover themselves, to cover their guilt and their shame, God looked upon their feeble, their fearful bodies and he shows compassion and mercy in the very thing that was the direct result of their sin, their eyes being opened, they had to cover themselves for their nakedness and their shame. In that very consequence, God doesn't leave them to wallow in it. God intervenes and covers them completely. What with? Clothes made of skin, animal skin. Where did it come from? Nearest kangaroo, bear? Don't know. Whatever the case, whilst the word's not used in Genesis 3 there, a sacrifice has been made. Blood has been shed so that God could clothe Adam and Eve, so that Adam and Eve might be able to fulfil God's plan and purpose for them, so that they might go on serving the living God, even outside the garden. We make many futile attempts, don't we, to cover our sin and our shame and our guilt. But friends, God has come to us. He searches us out and he's clothed us and he covers our sins. (coughs) Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. We are blessed, aren't we? Our sins have been forgiven. They've been covered once for all. The Lord will never count them against you. Our hearts have been sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and our bodies washed with pure water so that we can now worship and serve the living God and live and do that with a clear conscience every day. So can I encourage us this morning to encourage one another every day of that truth. Let's pray. Father, we do wonder and are just so grateful for your grace that whilst we were even your enemies, you loved us, that your son died for us and shed his blood for us. Not just to fix us up, not just to make us right again, but to make us true. Father, so that we might worship you so that we might come into your presence and know you for who you are. Our Father and our God, full of compassion and mercy, holy and righteous. And Father, that we might share with you in your glory and in your great plan for the nations. Father, we pray that you might continue to speak to us by your spirit. Father, that we might have those around us who encourage us each day to remind us of these great truths. That we might walk with a pure and clean conscience, not trying to justify ourselves, not hiding from responsibilities, and not breaking up our relationships. But Father, having a clean conscience and therefore being able to love freely, being able to worship truly and being able to live in the fullness of your grace and mercy and life abundant that you've given us. We thank you for your dear Son who shed his blood for us. We thank you for your spirit who opens the eyes of our hearts that we might hear and know these things, that we might come to you
confidently, knowing that with you we find mercy and grace. With you there is full redemption. Amen.